What if the Bible had never been written? Many in our day dismiss the Bible, but if you look at the facts, you'll discover that the Bible is, in reality, the indispensable foundation of our freedom and prosperity. We wouldn't have it if we didn't have the Bible, and we're in danger of losing it as we push the Bible aside. Hello, I'm Rob Pacienza, pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale. Welcome to this special program, What If the Bible Had Never Been Written? Based on the best-selling book by Coral Ridge's founder, Dr. D. James Kennedy and Dr. Jerry Newcomb. I'm here at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., a state-of-the-art museum in our nation's capital, which focuses on the history and impact of the Holy Bible. The Bible is now so readily available that we almost take it for granted. But it wasn't always that way. As one of its human authors tells us of the Bible, for the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That has made the Bible both the treasured repository of God's Word and a threat to tyrants and demagogues. The Bible is a powerful, transformative, and supernatural book given by God himself. And as you'll discover in this program, it has transformed life on this planet in ways you likely don't even know about and experience every day. History, prophecy, parables, Wisdom and the Lord's Covenant are contained in this most holy and miraculous book of books, the Bible. Having withstood legions of attackers and weathered millennia, the Bible and its truths have endured the test of time. If the world goes on for another one, two, or three thousand years, there could never be another document that would ever be its peer uh, because it is matchless and it's limitless. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The words of Jesus, recorded in Mark chapter 13, verse 31. The Bible's influence on us is amazing. Many of the languages would never have been set to writing. Hundreds of the languages in this world were first set to writing by Christian missionaries so that they could translate the Bible and uh, the Christian liturgy into that as of yet unwritten tongue. Even to this day, there are language groups where they have no writing, but who is it that's on the forefront of translating those writings? It's the Christian missionaries. There is a strong link between literacy and prosperity in life. Considered one of the greatest writers of all time, William Shakespeare wrote well over 1,300 allusions and direct references to the Bible in his works. He received most of his thematic inspiration from the Bible, penning his plays about sin and redemption, justice and mercy, and good and evil, to name a few. Themes which point to the image of God and his creation. Handel's Messiah, perhaps the most famous piece of classical music in the world, was undoubtedly inspired by the Holy Scriptures, composed in 1741. This timeless masterpiece is still performed to this day during Easter and Christmas. It was written at a time when Handel was very down in his life, but for 24 days when he received this, this uh, libretto, which means the written words, 73 Bible verses, more of them from the Old Testament than the New Testament, all pointing to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And he felt so inspired as he was writing these things down feverishly. One day his uh, servant came in to bring him food and he saw 
handled and he looked ecstatic and he felt like I had just seen and witnessed the Most High God. He had just written the Hallelujah Chorus. One aspect of Christian influence that we don't even think about is when we hear church bells and we hear chimes such as the Westminster chimes. The Westminster chimes is actually a prayer. Lord, through this hour, be thou our guide, so by thy power no foot shall slide. In other words, help us this very hour, Lord, to not fall into temptation. The Christian faith has an incredible influence in our world in ways we don't even think about these days. Without the written word to guide mankind throughout the centuries, infanticide would be common practice, the value and stature of women would be lessened greatly, and slavery would be the norm, as has been the case in cultures where the Bible has not permeated. The truth is, is that the Bible and Christianity gave birth to modern civilization. The integrity of the individual, the right to wrestle and think with big ideas, all of that is the fruit that comes from the Bible itself. The world would be a very different place if the Bible had never been written. And not just in terms of art, music, literature, ideas, architecture, uh, but even mores, uh, the, the way that we relate to one another. If you go right back to the Bible itself, really it began with this cataclysmic, earth-shattering teaching that every uh, man and woman is made in the image of God and that Christ died for all. And perhaps the most revolutionary uh, statements in world history come from the Bible, this idea that every person has innate and ineradicable value. The idea uh, that people are naturally free is a Christian idea, and this was taken over then by the moderate enlightenment by people like John Locke, who explicitly appeals to uh, the teaching of the Bible that we are made in God's image to talk about human freedom. When Christianity swept the Roman Empire, one of the things that changed, no more crucifixion, no more cruelty, no more torture, and no more games where people are killed in the Colosseum. You know the proof of the pudding by tasting it. And so if the gospel goes places and the standard of living goes up, the health goes up, the longevity of people increased. Infant mortality goes down. Education levels and literacy levels go up. What does that say? It, that bears, it bears fruit. Slavery brought to an end, see. People's equality, human rights promoted. What does that say? To me, that's quite an endorsement for the truthfulness because it's effective. I believe with no peer and with no exception that the most influential doc single document or book uh, on, uh, on morality broadly or narrowly defined is the Holy Bible. Above all, it's timeless and its truth and its orthodoxy has influenced countless numbers of people for good in ways that we'll never know. The Bible. The whole Bible and nothing but the Bible is the religion of Christ's Church. The Bible is the best-selling book in the history of the world. But more than simply a book upon a shelf, the Bible has the power to transform cultures, governments, and individual lives in the Protestant Reformation, the emphasis became getting the text of the Bible into the hands of ordinary lay Christians, aided by the newly invented printing press. That meant translating the scriptures into people's native languages. In the English-speaking world, John Wycliffe, William Tyndall, Miles Coverdale, and others began this important work in the 14th through 16th centuries. But it was the authorized version, now known as the King James Version, first published in 1611 that became the standard English Bible for centuries to come. Its endurance and impact have been astounding. The greatest masterpiece in all of English literature is the King James Version of the Bible, which came out in 1611. 
The King James Version of the Bible and its creation was a divine miracle. If they were to have the New York Times bestseller list, every month, all top 10 would be the King James Bible. It is the world's best-selling book ever, the King James Bible. It made a tremendous impact on Western civilization. Any honest student of American and English history must admit that the Bible, the King James Version in particular, has played a key role in history. What most people don't realize is the high price that was paid to get the Bible into English, a price paid in blood in some cases. October 6, 1536, Belgium. 42-year-old Englishman William Tyndale is about to be strangled to death and burned on the orders of King Henry VIII of England. His crime? Translating the Bible into English from the original languages. Having the Bible in English violated a law in that country that dated back to 1408. William Tyndale had desired that even the plowboy could be able to read the Bible for himself. Just before he was executed for his efforts, he prayed, God, open the King of England's eyes. In 1538, two years after Tyndale's execution, King Henry VIII approved for the first time ever an official English translation of the Bible. It's called the Great Bible. Little did he know that major portions of this and several subsequent English Bibles came from the illegal translation work of William Tyndale. Much of what they used actually got back to Tyndale, William Tyndale, one of the great heroes of the Christian faith who translated the Bible into English. One way Tyndale's massive impact can be seen is through the English words he coined in order to best translate the original Hebrew and Greek. Three prominent examples are Passover, scapegoat, and atonement. And one of the great translators of the Bible um, and the Psalms in particular, was a Gloucester man, William Tyndall. And um, he, uh, his choice of language is just fantastic. In 1560, another version of the Bible was produced in English, the Geneva Bible, so named because it was produced by Protestant exiles who had fled to that Calvinist city in Switzerland. It was not welcome as an officially sanctioned Bible. In fact, half a century later, when King James I took the throne, he took aim at the Geneva Bible, which had become so popular among the Puritans and the Separatists. The king didn't like the Geneva Bible, and so he wanted to have a translation without margin notes. The commentary notes in the margins were like an early version of a study Bible. Where the biblical text merited it, the Geneva Bible notes pointed out that sometimes we must obey God rather than the magistrate. This particularly galled King James. He wanted zero margin notes, and he wanted it to be the best Bible that ever was so that nobody will ever bother translating another Bible again. King James set up a committee to uh, make a new translation of the Bible, which is still used across the world, the King James Bible, and the language of that, the prayers, uh, is so musical, so beautiful. Uh, how could you improve, for example, on the Lord is my shepherd, I cannot want? That says, says it all. And 150 Psalms with language like that uh, is just such a treasure trove of beautiful imagery and beautiful expression. For example, anyone familiar with the King James Version of the Bible can recognize its cadence and phrases as found throughout the speeches and writings of Abraham Lincoln. The second inaugural address is impossible to understand apart from the King James Version of the Bible. Very clearly, uh, Lincoln, uh, at every stage of his life, was deeply influenced very directly by the King James uh, Version of the Bible. Uh, all of those Anglican divines, but people like uh, Lancelot Andrews and so many others, they could not have known uh, the kind of direct influence uh, that their fluidity of language, their eloquence, the a sense of being erudite, and really understanding the power of language and of getting the right word into the right spot could have had all these years later. Even four score and seven years ago from the Gettysburg Address is King James English. The King James Bible, and all the Bibles for that matter, but particularly the King James has impacted English as a language. 
We have these phrases, turn the other cheek, walk the extra mile by the skin of their teeth, uh, the David and Goliath struggle. These are phrases that we use uh, often and yet they go back to the biblical language in, in the King James. Indeed, to this day, many common idioms and phrases in the English language come directly from the King James Version of the Bible. In his day, King James I was known as a persecutor of Christian nonconformists like the Puritans and the Pilgrims. But no one can deny his pivotal role in creating a beloved version of the scriptures which has stood the test of time. The King James Version of the Bible is the ultimate crown jewel. It is the fountainhead of literature. It is the fountainhead of music. It is the fountainhead of drama. It is the fountainhead of poetry. It would be impossible to understand uh, the idea of the fine arts, the liberal arts, the humanities, uh, apart from the King James Version of the Bible. The impact of the King James Version, as well as every other faithful translation of the Bible, stems from the fact that they are representations of the original Hebrew and Greek scriptures. And as the Apostle Paul writes, all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Those who have taken seriously the teaching of the Bible have made enormous advances and innovations in history. Because we live in a fallen world where sinful human beings tend to abuse each other, a system of laws is needed. But those who have the power to punish are themselves sinners. So how do we avoid tyranny? Wrestling with those questions on the part of thinkers who have taken God's truth seriously help lift the Christianized world out of despotism and into ordered liberty. The impact of the Bible especially in the English-speaking world, on the foundations of law and government are incomparable. It's universal. All human beings and all civilizations have a moral code. No civilization could survive if it didn't have laws that they believed were morally true and right and good. Laws don't just, you know, tell you what to do. They express a worldview. Show me your laws and I will show you your God. If you believe that no one has any authority over you, you are God. So the question is, which God are you willing to serve? God's law given directly to Moses for the Israelites records the way God's people were to live. It was part of what marked Israel as his holy and blessed people. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? The Bible talks about the law in three different ways. There are the Ten Commandments. They are the reflection of the character of God. Then there is a ceremonial law, and there is a judiciary law. God gives commandments and laws and orders and directives and principles for our good. And when we follow them, we are blessed personally uh, for doing so. There's freedom, there's liberty, personally and otherwise, when we walk in accordance with right and wrong, and that is uh, walking in a manner that is in accordance with God's will and God's law. Had God not given Moses the law and it been recorded in the Bible for future generations, Law and civil morality as we know it today would not exist. The Ten Commandments, the Levitical Code, and the Sermon on the Mount have all been influential in developing legal systems and ethical norms in many countries. People don't understand that without the Bible, we wouldn't really have a moral compass. A world without the Bible is a world where there's no moral rudder, there's no conscience, there's no guardrails to life. Nobody can impose their morality on me because my morality is just as equal as their morality. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. The Magna Carta in 1215 has been looked on by historians as the document transitioning society from traditional rights to written legislation while safeguarding basic human rights. 
A couple of centuries later, the Bible also directly influenced the first laws established by the pilgrims in America. When you look at the entire pilgrim story, you had William Bradford, who was a member of the church, he, uh, but he was also governor, and he would preach on Sundays. Governor Bradford in the original Plymouth Colony took biblical principles and realized that when they're applied to a community, you can have a thriving, lawful, ordered society. Every law they passed in civil government, they believed had to agree with the Ten Commandments. You look at the charters or the constitutions of the original colonies, the Mosaic Law was considered foundational to all law. The fundamental orders of Connecticut, you find references to religious orientation. In the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, you find the same thing. In the basic laws, you know, the Charter of uh, Virginia, and also in Maryland. In all the colonies, there is some reference to a higher being or to some kind of a moral framework. Washington, D.C. is filled with religious symbolism all over the place, and the Ten Commandments, for that matter from the Supreme Court and a host of other places because we acknowledge that that is the basis upon which our legal system was established. The Christian faith was so firmly embedded in the American landscape that the Constitution of the United States couldn't have been produced by any other religion. The Constitution is the fruit, not the root. It's the fruit of the kind of pervasive Christianity practiced in America. Throughout history, we have seen that the lack of acknowledging a higher power by a nation leads to the moral decline of that nation. The farther you get from a biblical foundation in laws, the more decline you see. Tragically, in our country, we've been moving away from our biblical foundation in the law, and as a result, our legal system is breaking down. Now, as that breaks down, liberty becomes license. And we have to have more and more government to uh, maintain order because people are not obeying the law voluntarily. When you reject God, you also reject His commandments. And when His commandments are rejected by a society or by a government, that society and government has actually to multiply laws. It's a very paradoxical thing. The result is such that governments in the Western world uh, make law after law after law to try to control the Pandora's box they've opened by their rejection of God's Word and God's law. As an example, the U.S. Congress passes hundreds of new laws every year, yet the Ten Commandments, as written in Exodus chapter 20, are encompassed in less than 300 words. When the state no longer acknowledges God, it may not realize this, but it really has no basis for morality. It has no basis to be able to make laws except arbitrarily. Now, what we need to do is to help this society to see that if we have morality, it is ultimately rooted in God. But once God is no longer acknowledged, what you have is man on his own. And what that means is we have arbitrary morality, we have arbitrary truth, and these arbitrary ideas lead to destruction. And when you have politics, it's thumb on the scales. They can easily twist the law. So American law is becoming more and more the instrument of the powerful. So law is very important, but law alone without atonement and the Day of Atonement and Calvary will never be enough. If ever America needed atonement through the cross, it's today. Hi, I'm Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy, and I hope you're enjoying this special Christmas presentation of What If the Bible Had Never Been Written? As you've seen already, the impact of the Word of God has been unparalleled, providing the backbone for our system of law, as well as influencing the way we speak and write. And there's so much more of this incredible program that we can't fit into a 30-minute broadcast today. That's why I would like to send you the full unabridged DVD of What If the Bible Had Never Been Written, which you've only seen a short portion of today, as well as my father's best-selling book by the same name, 
all in thanks for your generous year-end donation of $100 or more to help us do even more in 2024 to defend freedom and declare the life-changing truth of God's Word. The DVD version of What If the Bible Had Never Been Written contains well over an hour of material, including how the Bible impacted the settling and founding of America, how it affected key figures who read it like Galileo, William Tyndall, and William Wilberforce, and so much more. This DVD is a powerful antidote to the poisonous lies public education and the media force feed the culture, including your children and grandchildren, telling them Christianity is an oppressive force that needs to be suppressed. But as you've seen already, that's as far from accurate historical truth as you can get. Shot in Britain, around America, and at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., this program features experts like Oz Guinness, Michael Youssef, Erwin Lutzer, and many more. That's the special DVD documentary, What If the Bible Had Never Been Written, as well as the specially published ministry version of the book by the same name by D. James Kennedy and Jerry Newcomb as thanks for your gift of $100 or more or we'll send you the book which inspired the documentary as thanks for your generous donation. Your donation helps us to produce and air television programming, produce podcasts and web content, publish books, and so much more addressing the most difficult issues of the day through the lens of scripture. When you make your gift right away, before midnight on December 31st, your donation will be essentially doubled in its impact through the $250,000 Gospel Truth Challenge Fund established by some generous ministry friends. So please, there's no better or more crucial time to donate than right now. We'll send you the book, What If the Bible Had Never Been Written, as our thanks for your generous donation and we'll send you the book plus the DVD documentary it inspired in thanks for your much needed year-end support of $100 or more. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll free 877-962-7677, or go online to djkm.org. Thank you for joining us for this special Truths the Transform presentation of What If the Bible Had Never Been Written. We pray that you and yours have a very Merry Christmas celebrating the Christ of the Bible who came into this world to save us. We'll see his power to transform individuals in action on the next Truths the Transform. I was looking for the meaning of life, rejecting all of the social values which were all arbitrary as far as I could see. That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.